you everybody for joining us. I understand that it's part of that busy summer term. So we really appreciate you making the time and coming along today. Um, so, and coming to our primary geography subject leaders network meeting. So welcome. And um, for those of you that haven't met me before, I just introduced myself. I'm Louise and I'm the Twinkle Primary Geography Product Lead. And um, I work with a wonderful team of geography teachers with teaching experience in Key Stage 1 and 2 in a range of settings. And we just love to help those who teach geography. So hopefully you'll be able to take some things that will help you away from today. So today's session is about celebrating all things fieldwork. So we're going to be thinking about the importance of it, the love for it, the joy that it can bring to children. So I'm going to start with a few exciting updates and then we're going to think about things like the importance of field work, how we can build skills through the inquiry cycle, how we can embed practice and build in progression, um, thinking about some options for field work visits and looking a little bit at the Geographical Association's Field Work Festival. So for exciting updates, the biggest update we have at the moment is our GeoWonders Geography Scheme. So GeoWonders is our brand new streamlined progressive geography scheme for Key Stage 1 and 2. And the first unit is now on site for Key Stage 1, the United Kingdom. But coming really, really soon in the next couple of weeks should be the next two units, which are around our locality and continents and oceans for Key Stage 1. And they'll be followed really quickly by settlements and land use, which are also which are key, lower key stage two units. And we would really love for any teachers who want to test out or give their opinions on these units. So please do indicate on the feedback form if you'd be happy for me to contact you by email. So tell you a little bit more about it. It is a streamlined scheme with each year group having three units of six lessons each and has carefully planned progression to develop and build upon concepts. It's rooted in retrieval practice with built in retrieval activities. These are built into the planning, but also you can see there a picture of some of the mini retrieval activities that are built into the pack as well so that you can use those at the end of lessons or as spaced retrieval and so on. And it also really building in progression in place as well, thinking about revisiting and developing the understanding of places in depth across topics by making sure that we're looking at those places from a variety of lenses. It's also flexible. It gives your teachers the autonomy to choose activities from the activity menu, um, but still being sure that that curriculum coverage and skills coverage is there. So and it also has both embedded fieldwork units and full fieldwork units. So embedded fieldwork in the units and full fieldwork units for each year group. And you'll see some of those that are coming soon with the around our locality, the land use and the settlements. They're all fieldwork units. So you'll be able to see what those look like really soon. And it also has built in assessment materials in with the assessment pack, which has things like show what you know tasks. It has a show what you know assessment. It also has those mini retrieval activities we uh, I showed you on the last page. And it's also got things like a double page spread that you can use to assess in different ways. So lots of different things in there to help you too. And there are also in the unit overview and each of the lesson plans, there are accessibility suggestions to help you adapt to and help your teachers adapt learning for additional needs. It's also supported by CPD. So our United Kingdom unit is supported by our teaching about the UK in key stage one CPD and by lots of other fantastic Twinkle products, such as um, our wonderful characters, Yasmin and Claude, who feature in quite a few of these things um, and also feature right across the scheme in our um, presentations. But we also have linked animations, which star Yasmin and Claude. We have some visual concept videos and we also have linked songs um, which are coming from Twinkle Tunes and coming very soon there should be some adaptive teaching packs as well with the first one to sit alongside the United Kingdom unit so that you can use those to adapt any teaching you need to for children with additional needs. And the other exciting update is our new animations. So we now have three fun and interesting geography animations, which feature our wonderful characters, Yasmin and Claude the Cloud. And brand new on site is the Discovering the UK one, where Yasmin and Claude travel around the UK in search of a geography vlogger. And they are along the way, they identify countries, capital cities, and have practice of using compass points. On site, we also have rainforests and the water cycle, which are proving really popular. So check those out if you've not seen them before. And coming next will be mountains. That's going to be the next animation that we're working on as well. So keep an eye out for that in the future. 
So moving on to our focus for today then. So thinking about why field work is so important. And I think one of the hardest jobs as a subject leader, as a geography lead, can be to get across just how important and fun and rewarding field work can be to non-specialist teachers and to, uh, to people who maybe struggle to see that field work it can be so valuable because it can be hard work at times. So it's if we can really inspire those teachers to give it a go, that can go a long way. And hopefully some of these reasons I'll share with you will help with that inspiration for, you know, inspiring your teachers and getting them to really want to get out there and have a go at field work. So in the last five years, the importance of field work has really jumped into the forefront of geography education in primary schools. And there are many reasons for this. Um, key documents have also regularly highlighted the importance, but let's think about why it's so vitally important for the children that these, sc these skills are planned and taught well. So the first reason I've got is real world learning. And I'd say few activities actually engage children as fully as getting outside and experiencing the real world and answering their own questions about it. We've all had that experience where you can see the way children's faces light up when they're doing those kind of outdoor activities and the connections they can make outside to seeing that learning in the real world. It can also be a wonderful way to engage some of the most difficult to reach children as well who might struggle more with classroom learning and you can find through field work you can really draw out that learning for them and help them be able to apply it and put it into context so that's a really important one another one i'd say is connection to their environment by experiencing and considering their local environments both the positives and the negatives children can really build that sense of place and belonging to an area and that in turn can nurture children's respect for the environment and where they live, which can help develop those active, caring citizens, getting them to care and have hope for their environment and feeling that connection can, uh, can really be important to the kind of people they end up being. And not just being taught about sustainability, but also getting out and doing field work and investigating it and building on their experience. And in this current environment with the environmental issues we face, it's so important that we develop that hope and care in the children that we're working with. So building curiosity is another one. Field work really builds those think like a geographer skills of asking questions and analysing information. Oh, sorry, I skipped forward there. Let's pop that back. Um, and analysing information and developing solutions to real world issues. And the connections that develop from this can develop a general ge geographical and scientific curiosity of wanting to know why things happen. All learning in the end is about curiosity and building that curiosity through field work can really drive that love of geography, really make them want to know more. A focus on solutions is another one, that field work isn't just about identifying those issues. We often think about it in terms of being able to identify issues in an area or pick up on problems. But it's also about exploring those possible solutions and communicating their feelings about things and their information with others. And this really does help develop that idea that they can make a difference and that hope is incredibly important, making that real difference to the world. Critical thinking is another really important reason behind field work. The skills learnt in field work can build critical thinking skills that can be applied across the entire curriculum. Field work enables children to strengthen their questioning skills in a real life context, and it also helps them make sense of and reflect on their learning and think how to question things and not take everything at face value. And these, those skills will really help them build a, a deeper understanding of things if they're really digging deeper into things and asking those questions. Green careers is another important one. The world, as we've already said, is ever changing, especially in terms of sustainability, which is now a factor in a huge amount of careers. And if they get to go out and do field work and take part in real life field work, they can see some of those skills in, in real life and get that future inspiration for skills and types of green careers they could become involved in and develop those skills that they may need in the future as well. Vocabulary building is another really great reason for field work. So when building vocabulary, if we're experiencing things and talking about them, it gives a real life context to that vocabulary, a real reason for that talk and a real purpose to it. And that allows children to practice and use the more common tier two vocabulary, but also using that subject specific tier three vocabulary alongside it. And it's not just talk in the classroom, it's talk about those real things. It's got that real purpose if we're using that talk when we're out in the field. 
Making connections is a, a huge one. Bringing out those links between location, place, scale, the environment and, ge and geographical thinking. Building a greater understanding of their classroom learning by putting those concepts into a real context. Those links can help them to understand concepts better and how those concepts come into play in those real situations. So an example, we can tell them to think in class about other people's views. But are they really going to be able to think about other people's views unless we get them out there carrying out surveys, asking questions of people and really experiencing other people's views and their feelings by putting that into that real context when they're then asked to consider other people's views in another context, they'll be able to do that a lot better. So making those connections between those different types of learning can be incredibly important for field work as well. It also develops locational knowledge. So our locational knowledge develops from our experience first. When we're really little, we learn our way around places by experiencing them, building this knowledge into our location schema. We develop our understanding of places in relation to other places. And the field work allows children to get that first hand knowledge of local areas and be able to look beyond and add that to their knowledge as they collect data, as they draw sketch maps, as they spot human and physical features. They build that into their location schema and develop that understanding of location, place and space and how those link together. So getting out there is not just important for their field work skills. It's also important, really important for that locational knowledge arm of being able to uh, sort of build that schema so that when they're working with things like maps, they've, uh, they've got that background knowledge of places and of where things are in relation to them. Cultural capital is another big term that gets thrown around constantly, isn't it? And um, the way it's summed up it with the section of the curriculum that's often quoted is the essential knowledge that they need to be educated citizens. And fieldwork gives children that essential knowledge of their immediate environment and the issues surrounding it. And by educating them on their local environments, it helps them to become informed, active citizens who are well versed on uh, in their local area and their local issues. It can have a real impact on their future and the type of citizens they might be and help them to really really experience that place. So it's really important for cultural capital too. And memory as well, by fully involving and immersing children in that geographical thinking, their key geography knowledge is put into that context, which helps build on previous learning and helps them experience geography, experience physical processes and really create that sticky knowledge that is going to stay put. So in the chat, if you've got any, I'd like you to drop in are there any other reasons why field work is important to you or any time when it's been particularly important to your class? I'd say for me, it's that engagement of all, it, all, of all children and that equality of experience. So if you have any reasons that you want to drop into the chat, then please do. So I've shared my reasons and the strong inspiration for why we need field work, but let's have a little look at what the key research says as well for why we need field, field work. So the research review in 2021 identified weak geographical skills and a lack of meaningful field work. Pupil, it said pupils need to develop the procedural knowledge and skills to collect, analyse, present and interpret information, that they need that regular practice of these skills is necessary, necessary to build fluency and that all pupils should get the opportunity to take part in field work. Geography and Outstanding Primary Schools, which was also in 2021, said that ge geographical skills were not taught particularly well and that field work was weak in Key Stage 2 and that Key Stage 2 children lacked opportunities to collect data that they could present and analyse. So we're starting to see that common theme and that field work was stronger in EYFS and Key Stage 1. They also identified that curriculum change was underway and evident in many schools. And I think you can see that in some of the changes that come through in the geography subject report, which was 2023. But although it identified that things were getting better, it also identified that it was still an issue, that COVID-19 had had a real impact on fieldwork provision. And a lot of that was in secondary, but I think also in primary. Um, but it has had a good impact in some ways by getting us to think more about how we can use the school grounds as well, rather than always having to go further afield. Um, but it also said that field work was underdeveloped in almost all schools 
and that schools needed to plan for progress in geographical skills so that pupils get better over time and that primary field work was often confused with school trips and that pupils need opportunities to observe, measure, record and present information. It also said that field work needs to be approached as a set of skills or a body of procedural knowledge that's to be taught progressively and built into the curriculum as a whole, that we're very good at doing this with um, with the substantive knowledge, with the with the curriculum knowledge. But when it comes to the field work skills and that procedural knowledge of how to carry out those skills, we're, we need to really think about how we're going to teach those progressively in our curriculum and build that in. They also said that opportunities should be made to practice skills outside of visits for fluency. So thinking about that embedded field work, which we'll have a look at in a moment, and that schools need support to get the most out of their school grounds as a field work location as well. So that's really interesting, isn't it? It's this is something that uh, embedding it, embedding the field work is something we're working really hard to build into our Geo Wanderers curriculum to not only support you with carrying out field work, but also that embedding and mapping the progression and I think that that if, it, if there's any other help that you think we can be to you in terms of how auditing those school grounds and thinking about how you can use them as a field work location but that again is something that you could do as a staff meeting it's something that you could get out and give advice to you could do it one-to-one -one. so there's lots of different ways in which you could in which you could do that so this is the question that we often get back at us, but yeah, it's worthwhile. Field work's really worthwhile, but isn't it hard? We've got to do risk assessments. We've got to do visit planning. We need the subject knowledge to be able to do this properly. The uncertainty of real world, world data. What if we go out there to collect data and the data doesn't show what we think it will? How's that going to affect the lessons over the that follow on from that? Or, you know, what if we get out there and we, we can't collect the data that we'd intended to collect? What do we do then? But it doesn't need to be hard. And I think that's what we need to show the teachers in our schools, that we can build the confidence in our amazing teachers to facilitate incredible field work in our schools. So ways you can build that confidence. Start small and local. Think about, we just said about auditing your grounds and local area to identify opportunities for field work. Now that could be what you walking around uh, with your curriculum and looking for opportunities of where things could happen in the school grounds where it isn't necessary to go out to make it easier for your teachers and need less adults and all of that kind of thing and need less in way of risk assessments and so on. So that could be something that you do as a subject leader and you go around and look at that. Or as I said before, it could be something where you go around as a staff meeting, looking at the curriculum and everybody identifies those opportunities together. But I think that's a task that's really worth doing to really support your teachers with not always needing a big trip and how they can use the school grounds for many of those field work opportunities and that some of those field work opportunities can be small ones rather than always having to be a full inquiry they can be practicing those skills rather than doing every single part of the inquiry providing support as a, as a subject lead you can provide that support to individual teachers if they need it but also you can provide that support through cpd so you can access CPD and you can provide CPD to them. And I've popped a link there um, on the slides that you will get to our CPD page that where you can go and look at the CPD that we've got. But I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Also planning together for progression, both full inquiries and opportunities to embed skills. We have CPD that will talk you through planning an inquiry and that can talk your teachers through it. But sometimes planning together to help get that progression across the school, thinking about which skills are going to be built in from EYFS, how that's going to go through key stage one, and then how that will continue through lower key stage two and upper key stage two to make sure they have the skills they really need when they're ready to go to secondary. And I'd say review it together regularly as well. Focus on those positives, have a look with your staff and, uh, and really talk to them uh, about what's going well and what they need help with and really have those conversations because that will help you know what you need to do next to help them build that confidence. And I would say a small thing on that, you're probably thinking it's summer term, I've got reports, I've got this, I've got that, I can't do this as a subject lead as well. And that's often how I felt as a subject lead too, there's so much to fit in. So I'd say, don't be afraid to go back to your heads and say, I want to do this, but I need time for it. Uh, I think as a subject leader, you, sometimes you really need that support. So don't be afraid to ask for that. 
So just to talk through the CPD options we've got that you could direct teachers to. So we've got a full range of topics. We've got fieldwork knowledge. We've got planning inquiries. And we've also got fieldwork tips for topics, which at the moment includes um, rainforests. And it includes, oh, wait a minute, I'll get there because it's on the next slide, I think. So yeah, there are our planning ones. So we've got planning and field work inquiry in EYFS and Key Stage 1 and then lower key stage two and upper key stage two, which can help you with thinking about that progression. And that will be something that's coming through GeoWanderers as well. We will be mapping out that progression in field work as well, which may help you if that's something you want to do too. And then those here are the quick tips ones that we have for fieldwork tips for topics, for topics that maybe sometimes it's a little bit harder to link your fieldwork to. So we've got for a rainforest topic there and for a seaside topic for how you might be able to bring um, bits of fieldwork into those. If there are any other ones that you think would be useful, do let us know. So moving on, let's have a little think about the fieldwork inquiry cycle. So the fieldwork inquiry cycle is great for both full fieldwork inquiries and going right from beginning to end. And that's so important as well. It's really, really important that when we are carrying out field work, that we are making sure that children do get a chance to do inquiries from beginning to end, right from the questioning through to the evaluation. But not all field work has to be that. Sometimes you might just pick and choose one or two of these to do within a unit. And I'll come on to that a little bit more in a moment. So the stages of that field work inquiry cycle. So we've got the questioning. We've got the, where we want to think about what do they want to find out and what is it they want, what is it they want to do and what is going to be the purpose of this field work. That's one of the big things that comes through in a lot of the key research is that field work needs to have a purpose. We need to be prepared for it beforehand. So ideally your questioning, your planning all needs to come before you're collecting data so that children know what question they're trying to answer. And in the ideal world, they'll have a bit of input in that question, that questioning as well. And then planning, what data will they need to collect? How will they need to collect it? And what equipment will they need? And then when they get onto the collecting data, that's our getting out in the field. That's doing our, that's our recording, our measuring, our observing, the bit that maybe people sometimes think is, a, is more tricky, but doesn't have to be. And then the presenting data, we could be drawing graphs, maps, we could be presenting it in uh, we could be presenting it in a variety of different ways it could be all sorts of different all sorts of different things and then analyzing that data looking at it what does it mean do we understand it can we explain it are there any patterns communicating their results so thinking about how are they going to communicate this is this something where they're going to need to communicate their results to the head teacher is it something where they need to communicate their results to the rest of the class is it to do with the wider community and in what way are they going to communicate are they going to write a letter do a presentation are they going to create a poster how are they going to communicate those results and sometimes that communication of those results might actually be in taking some sort of action as well so it might be communicating their results might be actually we've analysed the data and we've found that there's not enough flowers that will attract wildlife. So we're going to go out and we're going to plant some. So sometimes communicating, communicating their results can be a physical doing of an action as well. And then evaluating. This is an important bit and often can be the bit that gets missed off. Was the inquiry successful? And would you change anything in that inquiry? So really thinking about that metacognition and thinking about, you know, how would they do it differently next time or what went well? So embedded practice, as we've talked a little bit about, about already, is embedding those fieldwork activities throughout your curriculum to help children practice and build in fluency in their skills. And the subject report refers to carrying out elements of fieldwork rather than carrying out the whole cycle. So I've put together some examples for each stage of the cycle with ways it can be embedded to try and help you with that. So questioning. So over time, in terms of their progress, children should become more independent in their questioning and start to suggest their own questions around a topic. Questions can also become more comparative as they move up the school. So in terms of embedding this, practicing this skill on its own is about establishing a culture of curiosity valuing children's questions and asking about where we might find those answers. Questioning's more about that general lesson culture and the oracy and thinking about building in, asking questions, building on those questions, questioning their own assumptions and easy activities you can do to help with that. So a nice one is um, take a picture. So think about what do we know? 
um, what could we find out? What questions could we ask? Um, how valid is the source that we're using? So all of those things. So for instance, I've got here um, it's a picture from Wales. Um, and I've also got another picture here, which hasn't isn't actually taken in Wales. And that could be part of how you present it. So, uh, you know, would the assumption from this be that there is a problem with litter at this tourist landmark or what or do we need to identify actually where these sources have come from? So all of these kind of that kind of questioning and pulling things apart. What can we tell from the picture? What can we see in that picture? Um, is there anything that we might not be able to see? in that picture, what might be the story behind it. So all of that questioning can come through a simple picture like that. And that can really help them with starting to develop those fieldwork questions when they do their inquiries. Because if they're really thinking about all the different questions that could be pulled out from a picture or a topic, that can be really helpful. And that can be another way to pose a topic, create a spider diagram around a topic and really think about what are we going to, which area we're going to dig into with our fieldwork. Um, you might be about asking asking questions about lessons. So do you have any questions after today's lesson that we still haven't been able to answer? Do you have any questions that have popped up from today's lesson that has made you think about? And another good way, way is those questioning cartoons. So the kind of cartoons that um, where you can get them to ask different questions. So this is an example from one of our Geo Wanderers units about change over time and discussing those opinions of those different people can really help them to question how people might feel as well and to question what the issues might be around change over time. So there's lots of different easy activities you can do to embed those skills in for questioning. For planning, as children move up the school, you'd expect their planning skills to progress to being more independent, that they'd be considering more of a range of options in terms of their data collection, and that they might start to consider the validity of sources and also their sample sizes. So starting to think about actually how valid is my data if I've only asked three people? Is my data more valid if I've asked the whole class? Is my vote data more valid if I've asked some people of different ages and all of those kind of little things that get them to start to think about the, vali the validity of data. So um, thinking about embedding, think about providing different sources for children to choose between outside of inquiries, discussing their reasons for those choices, discussing what they want to find out during a unit and how they could do this, and also considering why certain approaches might not work when they're, they're planning. So thinking about, if I was going to find this out, I'd want to do that. They don't always have to actually be carrying it out. Sometimes you can just talk about what you would do. And so here again, we've got an example here of a picture and thinking about which source is the most valid. So I've got two pictures of London here and neither of them are an invalid source. They are both pictures of London, but we can consider which one might be a better source and why. Are there certain things that some of these sources are hiding? We can get a wider view from the first one, but we can get a more detailed view from the second one. One gives one impression, one very, very different impression of the colour of the water in London compared to this one here and thinking about what that might tell us. Um, some other easy activities that you could do are thinking about atlas work. So looking at which map would be best to use. Is a world map going to be better for this? Is a continent map going to be better for this? Or do we need something more local? And thinking about is there any benefit of digital versus atlas when we're doing this? Also taking inquiry approach in lessons where they're always thinking about where they could find this out and thinking about those choices can help them with embedding those planning skills too. So for collecting data, children will need to learn ways to collect both numerical data and opinion data and begin to decide which is more appropriate to what they're trying to find out. And to embed that, it's thinking about we might be collecting data in other subjects across the curriculum. It's something we often do in maths, but it also might come into English. It will definitely come into science. It may even come into, into some of your other subjects like um, design technology and things like that. So there are lots of opportunities for embedding these skills in other subjects as well. Also thinking about ensuring that progress is aligned with the maths curriculum. For instance, if they haven't learned about pie charts yet, that might not be something that we want to be posing to them. Um, another really nice one is quick hands up data collection. 
or class tallies. Like I know one we used to do just to get them used to the collecting data in Key Stage 1 was getting them to think about a quick class tally of what fruit snack they brought that day. And that doesn't necessarily fit into the field work, but it just re it reminds them of those different ways of collecting data. Um, also, um, digital data collection. So thinking about those links with coding and computing and science and thinking about where that digital data collection can be brought in within those other subjects to help embed those skills too. So some easy activities for those. So we talked about the whole hands up. So you could use hands up for opinions or you could split the class into categories. So go over there if you strongly agree, stay here if you're in the middle and go over there if you if you definitely don't agree and things like that, just to start getting them used to those um, sort of different ways of asking questions in surveys. And it doesn't have to be linked to a geography, th geography topic, it can be. But it does. Yeah, I can see there Rich mentioning the Likert scale, which is it, which is a brilliant way of doing that. Absolutely. Thinking about um, sound recording, interviews, emotional charts. Those all sound really brilliant ways to embed that as well. So thank you for those suggestions, Rich. Um, also thinking about things like class tallies on local issues. So if there's a local issue in the newspaper or something people are talking about, can you do a quick class tally on is litter a problem in our village or are there enough leisure facilities? It doesn't always have to be a big inquiry investigating that. You can have a discussion, share their opinions and collect that data in that way. You might also want to pose quite controversial subjects. So, so I can see if you were to pose a question like are pet owners a problem, then you're suddenly going to get all your pet owners in your class sort of saying, well, of course we're not. It's not an issue. But then you can start to bring out that discussion behind it and think about what data would have to be collected there. And, you know, can we do that quick hands up data to find out? And also you can really push that sort of thinking about the sample size by only asking a few children. If you were to ask that question to maybe three children in your class who um, you knew, weren't particularly keen on animals or didn't have pets. And then you're going to start getting the rest of them saying, but wait a minute, that's not fair. You didn't ask us. You didn't get our opinion. And that can really start to help them think about sample size and the validity of samples and how we need to try and make the way we're collecting data fair. So that can be a really nice one as well. So that's collecting data, presenting data. So think about different ways to present data and begin to choose the best way to represent their collected data. They should learn ways to present both numerical and opinion data, and they can use digital tools to help with this as well. So there are different ways that they could present that. So to embed that, think about presenting data again in other subjects across the curriculum. If you're collecting data in maths, you might then present it in a graph that you're learning about. Or again, if you're collecting data um, using, for using, for instance, um, a particular coding program or a particular kind of data logger, then you might um, be able to use that data, use digital technologies in your computing session to be able to then present that data as a graph. Hey, things like BBC Microbits and things can be great with that as well. And there's lots of the computing team have got lots of information to help you with those if you need some help, which is on site. Um, also, providing part presented data to add to can be another really nice one, giving them a, a partially drawn graph or displaying different types of presentation for um, discussion of which ways work best. So um, digital tools can be really great for this. And on the next page I've got, this has come from a website called Graphmaster, which I came across. And I put in some data for, is the park big enough? And it then displays it in these different ways. So it displays it in the four different ways so that you can look at it and go, actually, which of these is easiest to read? Which was the best way to present that data? So that can be a really nice activity to do to just really quickly show them those different ways and say, which one works best? Because then next time they do a fieldwork inquiry, they're going to go, oh, actually, when we did that, this was the best way of presenting it. But our data this time is slightly different. And we actually want to show how things have changed over time. So a different type of graph might work better. Or in this one, we want to show which was the most popular. So this type of graph is likely to be the best one. So yeah, that's a really nice tool that I came across that can really help with that. 
for analyzing data, really similar to the previous slide, these really go hand in hand. And it can be one of the easiest to fit in because we're doing it all the time without even realizing it. So for instance, we're drawing data from maps. We are um, looking at data um, from tables. We're taking data from newspapers. Oh, I can just see that somebody asking again, Graph Master was the name of the site that can be used to generate the four different graphs quickly. Um, and so children should become more confident with analyzing different types of data, beginning with using it to draw simple conclusions such as most, least, and then they might move on to being um, more comparative with data and also compare it starting to compare with secondary data. So you might be comparing local with national. So an easy activity can be if you've collected some local data, you can start to compare that with national data, for example, pollution data or something like that. If you've collected uh, data about a lot about some local water you could compare that with your local seas and rivers and the national data that's out and available for that you might present a key stat from a newspaper so and ask how valid is it who asked it we all know there are various ways stats are used in newspapers and that can be a really good way to draw their attention to how people can present data that to show a particular thing, but that that might not be a very fair way of doing it. And so that can be really interesting. Also, another easy way of bringing that in is thinking about what information can we draw from this map? So not always using maps to teach a particular skill or look at that, but sometimes just presenting with the map and saying, what does it show us? And that same could be done with a photograph as well. Um, and I'd say data about a country you're studying as well. Sometimes when we're doing units that have a lot of place knowledge in them, it can be quite difficult to sometimes get that field work in unless we're doing it virtually. So getting that data in about a country that you're studying can be a really nice way too. And there's it. Sorry, that was just an example I had there of one again that we're, we're going to be using in one of our Geo Wanderers units of where you'd be analysing that data to look for that correlation in where the volcanoes are around the world and where the tectonic plates are. So that just gives it gives another sort of example of where you might use that sort of map information to practice those analysing data skills. So communicating results is a really interesting one as well. It's not just about them being comfortable with communicating what they've found out, but doing that in a range of ways. This might be written, it might be oral, it could be by creating designs, by drawing maps, and they should become more familiar as they get older with appealing to a specific audience and backing up their communications with data. So that again, there are loads of links to other subjects such as DT, English, if they're regularly doing things like debating and communicating their feelings in their geography lessons, that will embed that skill too. And also explaining to a partner or a group what that data shows. So also get them to think about questioning other people's ways of working. So even experts. So if you're presenting some expert data that's come um, from a government website or it's come from a particular association or something like that, then still get them to question it. Is that the way they would have collected it? Is that the way they would have communicated it? How would they how would they have done it differently? Or do they think it's been done in the best way? So lots of discussion about any changes they would make and why and sharing those reasons is going to help them really think about the way they communicate their results as well. And then finally, evaluate. So it's a, again, it's one of those things that often gets missed out a little bit because we run out of time at the end of our inquiry and it's hard to fit in, just like it can do in design and technology as well. And so it but it is such an important skill that children should be able to evaluate their inquiries, use that metacognition to help them think about how they're going to get better at that skill and evaluate how successful they've been think about was that the best way of collecting data and could they have communicated it more clearly and ways of embedding that are encouraging like we said on the last slide really encouraging children to think about questioning theirs and others choice and other people's choices as well so could this chart we're using be clearer would you use the same survey questions as these people have did that survey question lead people in some way is there a way you could make it fairer so all those discussion points can really help to embed those skills too right so 
again, if you'd like to, you can drop into the chat any ways that you have found of embedding different field work inquiry skills that you have found. Rich has already shared some great, some great different ways that they do things there, particularly in terms of their collecting data. So they're really nice ideas to take with you too. So moving on then to think a little bit about field work visits. So these, it's so important that these visits are used for meaningful, purposeful field work because they do, when we're going out, when we're not doing field work within our school grounds, there's often a cost involved. There's a lot of planning. There is hard work that has to go into it. So it's really important that they're being used in the best way. So although the vast majority of field work can take place in the school grounds or the local area, sometimes we would like to go further afield. And there are some great options for that, no matter what your confidence level or your teacher's confidence level is. And as with all visits, it's really important that you carry out the appropriate risk assessment um, for your field work. And it's important that we consider the purpose of the visit and how it fits into the learning that we're doing. So most often field work visits will revolve around the data collection stage, as we've already said. So whether this be sketch maps, photographs, sound recordings, tally charts, surveys of people's opinions. And we need to consider the planning and preparation children might need to do before heading out. Have they been involved in planning that field work? Because if you're going to go out and carry out a field work visit, it makes sense to build in that time beforehand to make sure the children are prepared to do their data collection and they know what question they're trying to answer before you head out on that visit. So key questions to consider. Have the children got a question to be answered? And are they all aware of what that question is? Ideally, they would also have input into creating that question too. Have they planned how the data will be collected? Do they know what they're going to do and how they're going to collect that data when they get there? Do they need to prepare or be provided with any data collection resources that might be providing with maps or charts? They might need to draw charts in advance that they can record their data in. They might need to come up with survey questions. They might need to take with the measuring equipment such as cameras, tablets, rain gauges, meter sticks, all of those kind of things that we might need in our field work. So it's really getting them to plan ahead and you and getting your teachers to plan ahead that little bit as well to make sure that they are provided with anything they need ready to collect that data on when they go. But I'd also get them to think about, do you need a backup plan for if they struggle to collect the data? So we're planning to go out and carry out a survey and ask people, but everyone we asked doesn't want to be asked. Or we were planning to go to this place, but when we got there, we couldn't access the site because of weather issues. So always think about, is there a backup plan for if we get there and this data collection doesn't work? Is there going to be a different way that we can collect that data? So if we can't find people to ask, can we can we pivot and instead look at the physical ways that that issue is showed in the environment? So always sort of be prepared for uh, for having things not necessarily go to plan as we might need to when we head out of school in any capacity, really. So risk assessments, as we said, are very important too. Um, if you're using a company to help you with your field work visit, they should be able to help with that as well. But it's really important to consider your group's particular context and how you can make each visit as inclusive as possible for all children in that group too. And think about will any children need any extra preparation um, or resources to get the most out of their visit? Those can sometimes be having conversations about what will happen, um, exploring um, sort of images of what the place might look like. Sometimes having that extra preparation will help um, some children get more out of the visit. And that can be something that you do with individuals or it can be something that you do as a whole class as well so that everybody feels prepared for what's coming up. I've also linked on this page our example risk assessment that you can use to help you think about the sort of issues that you might want to risk assess when you're going out on a visit as well. So field work visits, also possible ideas for field work visits. So you might want to link it to a local physical feature, such as for some people that might be a seaside town, for some people that might be a mountain, for some that might be a river, for some it might be agricultural land, for some it might be housing. There's all sorts of different things it, it could be. And there will be a physical feature that you could use within your local area that you can base uh, a full inquiry on and it's in it's important again to think when you're auditing that local area about which features might be good which units would be good to use for a field work inquiry 
based on what you have got available to you and what's not going to require maybe a coach or something like that or what's going to require a shorter journey to get to it and that kind of thing. Another good example, good option can be visiting a local tourist attraction to focus on the impact of um, of tourism as well. And um, I can see here that somebody talked about the best place to put solar panels and those areas can be really good as well visiting kind of local areas I remember um in the last school I worked in we did a we did it actually it was turned out to be a whole school trip in the end because it was linked with technology but we we went in groups to the local wind farm and talked to them about how people have found that and about whether there'd been resistance to it and how it contributed to energy so really making the most of those things because that was literally i think five minutes down the road from us so we were able to do it via trips in a minibus and it made it much easier to get there and a really other nice point i can see in the chat being posed as well is that when you're thinking about your risk assessment is thinking about getting them to mitigate the risks themselves as a class if you're posing that information to them in advance they can talk about the risks with you and they can start to risk assess a bit for themselves as well that's a really important point so thank you for that um, also, local shops or businesses can be another really good one to go to build in things like exploring trade in your local area or exploring where food comes from can be great if you have a local supermarket or a local shop that you can use to go and look at some of the backs of those packets and where things are coming from or to be able to collect some data on the sort of things people are buying and whether people are buying local or whether they're or whether they're, there's a lot of food miles happening there's all sorts of things that you can investigate for within a local shop or a local business so but I would say caveat on that is make sure you get permission don't just turn up at your local shop with 30 children and hope they'll be happy with it because they may not be so um, also we said focusing on environmental issue in your area we we're talking about the wind farm there but you could also do things like water pollution coastal erosion this will all very much depend on what issues are within your area and if you choose issues that are pertinent to your local area you're going to find it easier to find people who want to give their opinions particularly if they're collecting survey data so for instance in certain areas that coastal erosion is a huge issue and so people will be you know very willing to voice their opinions on it and their opinions on what should be done and what solutions should be happening so those are quite it's really good if you can choose issues that are hot topics in your area um, air pollution can be another good one. It's very easy to get um, secondary data for that, that you can link with, link with any data you're collecting. Um, and renewable energy can be a, another good one, like we talked about with the wind farm or solar farm, all of those kind of things that are good areas that you can bring in. And often these companies are, you know, very willing to get involved and help you with that. So other hot topics might be things like a new housing estate or a new business being built or um, how money is being used to create certain things in the area. So all of those can be things that people have a lot of opinions on. And so they can be interesting topics that you can bring into your field work and into your geography to really base it around your local area. So also another way is allocating part of a residential to field work so that children gain that hands on experience in other places rather than just their local environment that can often be with older children. But sometimes residentials can be very much based around the sort of physical things they do, you know, high ropes or, uh, you know, carrying out other the other activities like um, uh, like swimming activities or going in the river, but often we are by those lovely locations that could be ideal for being used for field work as well so think about whether parts of residentials can be used in a in a nice way to build upon your geography curriculum as well so some really good sources for support the field studies council they offer a wide range of residential and day trips so it's really worth checking out what they've got on offer um, the Canal and River Trust are another really good one. They've got a range of experiences and a huge range of educational sites. They've got a lovely map on their website that shows you where their different educational sites are. And a combination, they offer a combination of on-site workshops, museums and visits to schools. And the other amazing thing about theirs is many of them are free. Not all of them, but there are lots of free experiences that you can access through that and the Youth Hostel Association as well. They're more residential experiences, but they do offer Key Stage 2 packages at some of their hostels as well. So that can be worth checking out. 
Um, there are also lots of other more locally based sources. So it can be a really good idea having a search for field work. Or the other thing I found when I was researching this is that actually when you're searching on the Internet, field studies tends to be a term that companies use more to uh, advertise what they've got locally based. So bear that in mind as well. Um, also, some county council websites offer services for field work as well. So they can be really worth looking into, too, to see what you've got in your area. So I'd love to know if you've got a moment to drop it into the chat. What do you think are the best locations in your region for field work visits? So for me, my local region is um, between is around the Northampton, Milton Keynes areas. And we've got some great river locations, um, particularly in some of the smaller towns where they're easy to access places like Oni. We also have some really nice canal and river trust locations and a canal museum as well that can be accessed um, in Milton Keynes and Stoke Bruin. And we also have Milton Keynes Museum, which is um, which offers planning and it's, it offers information about how the city was planned and built. And they're creating a new exhibition on that at the moment. So, yeah, lots of those would be my ones. So it'd be really interesting to know what your favourite locations would be in case there's anybody else looking who thinks that actually you might share a really good one that they can go that they could use and they could go into. So just to finish off, having a think about the Festival of Fieldwork. So the, the Geographical Association are running this event throughout June. And yes, I'm aware that June is nearly over. And their theme is Field, Fieldwork is for Everyone. And this event encourages everyone to get out and do some meaningful field work. And it's a great way to raise the profile of field work in your schools and encourage staff to try out simple ideas with their classes. So the big question would be, is it too late to take part? And the answer to that would be absolutely not. The event is all about encouraging field work and helping schools with field work. And the geographical association have explained if you can't do it in June, it doesn't matter. Do it when you can and in the way that suits your school. The main point of it is to get out and do field work and enjoy it and really build that love of field work within your staff and within your and within your children as well. And the Geographical Association have lots of wonderful resources on their website to support you. And we also have some lovely packs that to support you too, which are linked. So we have a key stage one and a key stage two festival of field work pack that you can use. Um, and it's got lots of lovely ideas and resources there that might help you with celebrating field work. Or oh, brilliant to see using pedestrianised local high street. That's a really good, really lovely area that you could use for field work. A local river and local woods are oh, fantastic. So that's really great advice for anybody who is near Chesham. So really lovely, lovely examples there. Thank you. We've also got this leaflet for Festival of Fieldwork that shares a range of fieldwork resources from EYFS all the way up to Key Stage 4. So it's, this can be useful for all sorts of teachers and it just directs you to a lot of the fieldwork resources and helps you easily find all the ones that are on our site. So it's worth checking that out as well if you'd like some extra help with fieldwork or National Festival of Fieldwork. So I'd love to know if any of you have got involved with the National Festival of Fieldwork and um, or whether you've still got something planned to do um, you can drop those into the chat but also please do feel free to share those on our socials as well so that we can find out what you've been up to we do have a geography subject leader um, Facebook page and we also have a X or Twitter page as well that you can um, tag us on and share what you've been up to too so please do let us know if there's anything great you've been getting up to for the festival of field work so just to finish off, so the geography team's favourite fieldwork activities. So we've got Jane, who is an experienced teacher and one of our Twinkle Geography content writers. And she told us all about her year four rivers fieldwork opportunity and that one of her favourite fieldwork opportunities was at a local stream near their school. And there was a meander in the stream, which they labelled as a class. And the children drew labelled sketch maps of that part of the stream and measured the depth and the speed of flow of the stream at different places. The children had lots of fun and they were able to put their put lots of their learning into context through that activity. Hannah is um, an experienced teacher as well. She's also been a geography subject leader and she is one of our Twinkle Geography content writers and editors. And she shared that a field of work opportunity which she used to enjoy doing with her class was to walk in her local woods, looking at the human and physical features along the way, that they plan the route that they would take using a range of different sources before they left. And they'd record the different features they spotted in different ways. So using tallies, photographs, field sketches, just to name a few. 
and they'd use the information they gathered to help generate their next inquiry. She said, of course, they did have to play a few games in the woods as well at using compass directions. That sounds like great fun. And then Mike um, is an experienced teacher and tutor, and he is also he was also a subject uh, subject leader of geography, and he is also our Twinkle Geography team leader. So he manages our team, and um, his fieldwork opportunity that he identified was a memorable fieldwork opportunity that he used to conduct with his class was a walk to and an exploration of the local beach to identify the different aspects of the local physical geography. They'd record the different landscape features on the walk, such as cliffs, woodland, and beaches, by drawing, taking photos and completing a results table. The children were always amazed at how many different features they could identify in their local area. And then finally, my one was, I used to do an embedded fieldwork opportunity with year two as part of our history learning. And we'd carry out a treasure hunt around our local area, around the village using um, both historical and geographical clues. And that helped us to explore the local area using both modern and historical maps and identifying how the human and physical features had changed and using the information collected to help us locate where the treasure was hidden in the village. And we took lots of photos along the way and used these to then present our data in our own maps back in the classroom. So I'd love to know what your favourite fieldwork activities have been, so please do share those with us.